Okay, good evening everyone. We're continuing our series that we started a few weeks ago. Today it's uh, lecture number five. I estimate it should take 12 to 14 lectures altogether. And uh, this is called Pirkei Avot, the chapters of the sages. Uh, everything our sages, the rabbi says to us 2,000 years ago, everything they say 2,000 years ago, is basically nothing from their own opinion, even though they were very smart people and they had a lot to say. Everything they say comes from the Torah, the written Torah, the oral Torah, the Midrash, the Kabbalah. It's a combination of everything that Hashem gave us in Har Sinai, Mount Sinai, 3,320 years ago. This is great recommendation for life, even today, 3,300 years after we received the Torah. If you pay attention to all the details in Pirkei Avod and you have it in English, you can read your own with some good commentaries about it. You will see that it's going to have a great impact on your life and it's going to affect everything you do to the good side. So we'll continue. Just a, a little bit reminder here. Last time we finished, we in, we in chapter 2. And uh, all together we have six chapters. We are about to finish ch uh, chapter 2 in a few minutes. And well, the last we finished was that uh, Rabbi Yossi says, stay away from a bad neighbor. And Rabbi Shimon says, you have to be careful from people who borrow and, uh, and do not pay. In the old days, when you used to come to a Jew and uh, give him a loan, let's say a Jew needs a loan, right? So he came to you and he needs a loan, any amount of money, once you put two witnesses and you made a note that you gave him X amount of money and that day and that place and the witnesses sign it, the chance that you will not see your money back was very, very small. Mamash, only in an accident that this guy either died or he lost all his money. People used to be very honest, not like today. Word was the word. If a person borrowed something, he returned on a due date. Today, we cannot say that that's the case. Today, most of the loans are ending without people paying. They're defaulting on the loans. Either they pay very late. Unfortunately, it became a habit that they don't pay at all. So today, you have to be extra, extra careful. Which means, if today would they would write the Pirkei Avot, I'm sure they will be much more strict. Much more strict about their recommendations about giving loans to people. Why? There's something in Judaism called Chazaka. Chazaka means certainty. Chazaka. For instance, in the time when they wrote the Gemara and the Mishnah, there was a Chazaka, a status, a certainty. It's 100% that you, you will not be able to find a Jewish woman that let a man touch her before her marriage. Impossible. You go and search in the entire land, you will not find. No woman will allow such a thing. So they wrote it in the Gemara as a fact. I'll give you another example. It's impossible to find a Jewish woman that goes to do laundry in a lake or in a public territory. <coughs> Why? A Jewish woman will never allow a goyim that rides horses or donkeys to look at her. We're not talking women the way they dress today. We are talking women that were covered from A to Z. Even if you try to look at their body, it was impossible. Very, very modest. And those women, even just to show themselves by the lake to do laundry, they would not agree to such a thing. So you see, today, obviously, if they would write this uh, Mishnah on Gmarot, they wouldn't be able to write such things because the world has changed. The Jews are not exactly what they used to be. However, the same thing when it comes to loans. You gotta be very, very careful. So my advice to you today, based on seeing what's going on and today in the world and seeing what's, how many Jews are not paying back the loans, unfortunately. Even if they had an intent to pay back when they borrow from friends or from anybody, even at the time of the loan they really wanted to pay back, by the time the, the payment is due a year or two later or five, the evil inclination sometimes it's too strong and convince them not to pay back. So you've got to be very careful. So today, my advice to you, if anybody comes and asks for a loan, first you have to check if this person is a reliable person or not. For instance, if it is not, if it's a person that is not religious, that means he does not have any fear from God. He's not afraid of Hashem. He's not afraid of Hashem. Somebody who is not afraid of, Hashem, afraid of Hashem, there's a very high chance that he will not pay you back your money. 
very high chance. Why? There's nobody to be afraid of. Which means, if you give a loan to a goy that fear is fearful from Hashem, an Arab, a Christian that, that is afraid of God, is very religious in his own religion, even though their religion is nonsense, and it wasn't given by God, absolutely not, but the fact that they're afraid of God, the creator of the world, it's a very safe guard for you that you're going to see your money back. However, if you give it to a Jew, American, Israeli, it doesn't matter that he's not afraid of Hashem, he's denying the existence of Hashem or the existence of the Torah and all these things, somebody like this has a very high chance not to see the money. So we see something that is an absurd. You can see an enemy of Israel that you, that you gave him a loan, he still pay you back. Why? He's afraid of God. And you can see one of your best friends, since he's not afraid of God, he just won't pay the money. You've got to be very careful. So that's one thing. Second, here is another problem now. Second is, when he comes to take the loan, you ask him to give you guarantors. First you check if he's reliable. After you see that he's very reliable, he pays back and everything, you ask him to give you minimum, minimum three guarantors that is willing to sign for him that in case he doesn't pay by certain day, they are liable for the loan. Most of the time, they leave you alone, because it's very hard for people to find guarantors. If they find three good guarantors from the community, religious, respectable people, no, you did everything you can. But you've got to be careful today, because most of the people that I've seen, they give loans, they don't see their money back. Same thing in investments in business. You gotta be very, very careful who you invest a penny with. Many people are greedy, people promising them high interest, high profit, 20% a year, 30% a year, like Madoff and all his friends. And in the end, people getting wiped out in months. What they say for 20 years, I see it in 47th Street, in a diamond district, in a gold, in real estate, all kinds of investment. Just here in Queens alone, I can name 100 cases that I know of people who invested hundreds of thousands of dollars and all the money is gone. And some of the deals were involved with people with yamaka and a very fancy beard. So you, got, you cannot be naive. Okay, so this is the advice of the Mishnah. You gotta be very, very careful from people who borrow and do not pay. If they say that 2,000 years ago, it's needless to say today. We're continuing. The new Mishnah, it's Mishnah 10, in chapter, chapter 2, the 10th Mishnah, Chazal says, our sages say three things. Rabbi Eliezer says, You have to respect your friends like you respect yourself. You can never do to your friends something that you hate people to do for you. For instance, you make jokes at them, you make them a name that they embarrassed of, you laugh at their size, their weight, their nose, etc., 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 or they bought a car, or if they bought something that you don't like, it's not your taste. Any kind of embarrassing or disrespecting people is a very serious sin from the Torah. You gotta be very careful. Why? Certain things, it's much easier, it's between you and Hashem. So comes Yom Kippur, you fast, you cry, and Hashem wipes it from your fire. But with people, it's much harder to get forgiveness, because people are not so easy to forgive. Especially, some people are very sensitive. I have a friend, he's by now 50 years old, about eight or nine years ago, eight years ago, he went to work with his friend for one day, a gardener. He, you know, he didn't have a job for a week or so, so he was off the job. So he was looking to make some extra cash. The guy offered him to come and help him in doing gardening job. He's not a gardener, you know, but he watched the Spanish workers there. So he told him, I'm going to bring lunch, watch them that they don't steal anything you know because he knows he knows his workers they're capable of stealing so after he came back an hour later one tool was missing and he took and he deducted fifty dollars from his salary he was supposed to pay him let's say a hundred dollars that day so because one of the workers stole a, some one of the of the shovels or whatever it was so he deducted fifty dollars from it eight years after he hates him like he hates adolf hitler every time he hears his name don't mention his name to me, don't get me angry, I warned you. I said, what's the problem? It's eight years already, come on, it's only $50. I'll give you the money, just forgive him. Get it over with. He cannot get over it. Every time he got married, he did not show up. He had a boy, he invited him personally to come, to, he does not show up. For what? 
fifty dollars. You understand? And needless to say, sometimes if you offend the person in front of people, that's even worse. So you gotta be very careful. Sometimes you can buy an enemy with stupid comment. You come to Shammai, you have a serious problem. Why, Hashem, I'm very sorry. I would forgive you. We have an open case here. And that's why a clever person doesn't have problems with people that later you have to beg them for forgiveness. Just keep it clean. So that's what it is. There's a rule. There's a rule. Every time you want to say something to a person, before you say it, you have to think about two things. First thing is, if what I'm going to tell him is 100% true, or I'm going to exaggerate or make up a story right now, is it really 100% true? You see that most of the time is not. And even if it's true, you have to check one more thing. Saying the truth to him, how would I feel if I would be him and somebody would tell me what I'm about to tell him? Would I take it in a nice way or I get upset in my heart? After reviewing these two questions, you will find that there's no point of telling him that. And most of the stupid things you're about to say, he'll get safe from it by thinking two things. Is it true? How would I react? After thinking about those two, you say, you know what, it's better not to say anything. Then it says, be very comfortable to the people and make sure that you work on yourself not to get angry. Getting angry shows that you have no faith in God at all. That you do not believe that God runs the world. What's the connection? Chazal says someone who is angry is equal to a Jew that worship an idol. What's the connection? Just because somebody got me angry, so let's consider right here. Yeah, over there. Yeah. Yeah. Just because just because I'm angry at someone is it's considered that I'm I'm worshiping an idol? What's the connection here? What's the comparison here? So the answer is What's, what do we find in common between a Jew that is angry to a Jew that bowed down to Buddha? What do we find in common? The first one who bowed down to an idol shows that he's, this is his God, not the real God. This stupid statue, that's his God. Somebody who is angry at an, at another person, he caught him in a traffic or all kinds of things, he said something. So that shows that God is not the supervisor in his eyes. Why? Why are you getting angry at him? If Hashem didn't want you to have this agony, this uh, stress, this uh, embarrassment, whatever it was, he just wouldn't have it. Nobody can touch you without the approval of God. So if you got it, you deserve it. Check yourself. Don't start blaming him and him and him. Take responsibility. Because Hashem allowed it to happen, that means you deserve it. So why are you getting upset at him? The poor guy, he was a messenger to get you upset. He would rather not to, because later he's going to have to pay, because he has a free choice. But still, if you did not deserve it, you just wouldn't have it. What is it like like a dog? When, a, when you hit a dog with a stick, something very interesting is happening. The dog does not bite you. He tried to bite the stick. Even after a minute that you're hitting him non-stop, still doesn't realize that he has to attack your hand or something. He tried to bite the stick. If you throw the stick away all the way, away, you know, far away, the dog turns around and runs, and he bites the stick, and he barks at the stick. So what is it? We're not supposed to be like dogs. We are a little bit more clever than them, right? We have a soul. We are, we're intelligent. So what's the point is, getting angry at people, or getting angry that there is traffic, or getting angry that something that happened and you cannot control it, your brain, your suit got ruined, all kinds of things, showing that you don't understand that Hashem is doing it to you. So if a person leaves that my whole life is one thing, my relationship, relationship between me and my Creator, everything else is minor, it's irrelevant. Right now it's me and him. My wife said something, he wanted me to get it. This happened, that happened, they called me, all kinds of things that happens to us. If we didn't deserve it, it just wouldn't come. So now when he comes, we have to know how to handle it. And that's the test of life. So you got to be very careful not to ever get angry. But Chazal says, make tshuva, repent, before you die. Now since we do not know when we're going to die, that's one of the things Hashem never told us. Yomara said, David HaMelech, King David, ask Hashem, tell me the day of my death. I want to know what day I'm going to die. 
So Hashem say galui veyadu alefanai, it's a rule by me, that I never tell the person when he's going to die. Why? I don't want to eliminate his free choice. How do you eliminate the free choice of a person by telling him the day of his death? How do you do it? If you come to a Jew and tell him, dear Jew, you're going to, not, to die when you'll be 95 years old, and right now he's 40. What is he going to do naturally? Oh, there's no rush. What's the rush? I'll live until 90, 94. The last year, I'll take all the millions that I collected and cheating and stealing and doing whatever I want to do and start giving it out to tzedakah, charity here, charity there. I'll keep Shabbos. I'll go to yeshiva from morning to night. I won't even go home. I'll, I'll buy a bed in yeshiva. I'll be like with the kids, you know, I'll be there all year, I'll learn, I go to the mikveh every day, I eat only strictly kosher, I pray, I read Tehillim, and here you go. I die a complete righteous person. So what's the point of living 94 years? What do, what do Hashem need you here? He doesn't need you here. So the idea is that nobody can know never when he's going to die. No one. So, Hashem, so David Amelach said to Hashem, okay, if you don't want to tell me what age I'm going to die, at least tell me the day of the week. So Hashem told him, since you're a righteous person, I will do you this favor. It will be on Shabbat. You're going to die on Shabbat. So what David HaMelech did, he knew there's a rule. What's the rule? When a person sits and learns Torah, his chance to die is almost zero. Because it's protected from the actual learning of Torah. The holiness of the Torah can save your life even against all odds, against logic, you know, bombs falling, the building is collapsing, you learn, you can get saved. So well, every Shabbat, from the minute of Shabbat started, he did not stop for a minute to learn Torah. And the angel of death is coming to take his soul out, he cannot, he's afraid, when he hears Torah he runs away. So, you know, so the angel of death says, what am I going to do? <laughs> it's going to be like this forever. So what did he do? He pretended that somebody fell from the stairs in the backyard. He made noise. Oh, like somebody fell. And in, instantly, David Amelech jumped to see from the window what happened. And that second that he got up, he died. So you see, you cannot fool Hashem. Once the time came, the time came. One guy, there's a mashal, an analogy. One guy made a deal with the angel of death, Malach Hamavet. They became friends. The angel of death liked that guy. So they became friends, so they made a covenant. What's the covenant? He said, I want you since we became buddies, and you come to me and you talk to me, the angel of death is full of eyes. Full of eyes. And he had a sword. He had an arm with a sword, with a drop in the edge of the sword. And that's how he takes the soul out. He puts it in the mouth of a person, and that's how later the person is going to smell from that drop. That's what the Zohar, the Kabbalah, explains. It's full of eyes. Before a person died, all he sees is big eyes all over. It's very scary. So you look at the people before they close their eyes in the hospital. If they're able to move their head, are they nervous? They look around because they already see things. Plus, they can see also people that died already and come to accept them to the next world. So, so he made a deal with him. Don't kill me unless if you let me first make a vidui, a confession. What's the confession? A confession is a part of repentance. Yes. So what does it mean a part of confession, a part of repentance? Before a person died, he does Khatati, Aviti, Pashati, Ashamti, Gazalti, Naafti, all the list of all the sins, any, any al alphabetic order that a person is, is, is confessing. So that is, is the punishment that he's about to get. Why? By confessing to Hashem and admitting that I made the sin, it's already a part of the repentance. Of course, you have to regret, you have to be ashamed, you have to accept never to repeat it, you have to wait until Yom Kippur comes, because that's another part of the erasement that you're erasing your sins. But even a partial tshuva, partial repentance helps a lot. Just the person before he dies say, I'm sorry Hashem, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. Yeah, it's already helping. So, the angel of death, he wants to kill him now, but he cannot kill him. Why he cannot kill him? Because every time he has to kill him, this guy made an, a vow. I will never make a vidui. Not in shul when we pray in the morning, not in mincha, not, never, not on Yom Kippur. He made a rule. When everybody in a synagogue makes a confession, I never say it. Why? That could be my last day. Maybe I'm supposed to die already. It's not killing me because... 
He made a deal with me. I'm only going to kill you after a confession. At least one more last confession. So the angel of Dead Sea cannot take, it, take his soul out. So one time, he, he pretended that he's a wounded person on the road. So they, they, this person walks and he sees somebody screaming, Help, I'm dying. So he comes right away. Say, you, he said, well, what happened? Can I help you? He said, no, no, I'm dying. That's it. I have maybe a minute more to live, but just do me one favor. I don't know how to read. Can you help me to make confession before I die, please? I want to make tshuva. I want to I wanna repent. So he said, okay, just you say and I repeat after you. So the guy said, okay, chatati, aviti, pasha. Just when he, when he came to the word ta'inu v'tiatanu. That's a part of the confession. If you ever say that, so you know what I'm talking about. Ta'inu means we made a mistake, tiatanu, that means we made other people make mistake. As soon as he said the word tiatanu, the person became the angel of death. He said, oh, Baruch Hashem, I fooled you. You see, I couldn't take your soul out. You're playing games with me. <laughs> so now, once he made the confession, he took his soul out. Bottom line, nobody can escape his day. So, but the Gemara also say, when the time arrived for a person to die, the last day of his life, he doesn't have a free choice. And from the minute he wakes up, Hashem is directing him to the place where he's supposed to die. So if it's in a hospital, if it's in an intersection, if it's in a car, if it's in that street, whenever, if it's in the ocean, he has to drown. So automatically that day he doesn't have a free choice, because we have a free choice. We can go whenever we want. We can make a left, we can make a right, we can see it, we can go to sleep, we can come to, to, to learn Torah. It's 100% in our hands. The last day of your life, it seems that you have a free choice. But the last day of your life, you're a robot. So if you're supposed to be on a plane, and Al Qaeda is pretending a surprise for you, preparing a surprise for you, there's nothing you can do. You're going to be on a plane. And if you, if you didn't buy a ticket, by the last minute, somebody will cancel it. You know the story. Or if you, you need to get saved, so that's it, the same thing. Okay, anyway, so, so they say make repentance before you die. One day before you die, since we do not know when, has to be every moment. That's the idea here. Make sure that you feel the heat of the Chachamim, of the righteous people that learn Torah, always around you. Like, which means, even if you are frozen spiritually, how do you warm yourself up? By being around them. When they learn, you talk to them, you ask them questions, automatically they're warming you up, which means it's contagious. If you are sitting with holy people, you become like them. If you sit with the gangsters, the criminals, the gamblers, all the low lives, you become like them. There's no difference. Tell me who your friends and I'll tell you who you are. You understand? If a woman uh, has a few mothers, friends, that all day they care what they're going to wear tonight for the party, she becomes like them. That's it. Even if she has a class, naturally she's a spiritual person, just having these low life girlfriends will bring her very, very expressed to hell. You understand why? Because she's influenced by them. That's all they do. All day they talk nonsense, they watch all this stupid magazine. They don't have one gram of wisdom. You know what one gram is? Like a crumb of a cookie. Take their head, you shake it, there's nothing inside. You know, <laughs> you know if, if you make an open heart, uh, surge, uh, open brain surgery, if you open their brain, you see one wire. Only one wire. Not ten trillion. One wire. If you cut it, the two ears will fall off. <laughs> Not even one wire. Why? All day, what am I going to wear tonight? How am I going to do my hair? My hair designer, my stylist is not in town. What am I going to do? Which ring should I put? Uh, do you think it's matching? How oh, much? Like zero. You got to stay away from them. If you see you becoming religious, then one of the first things you have to do is to replace your friends. Don't follow your heart. But Rabbi, it's, it's my friends. I grew up with them. Yeah, but your friends, when they take you where you don't want to be, they're not going to be able to protect you. Then what are you going to say? Say, we're very sorry. Miri, Miriam, we're very sorry. What do you mean you're sorry? I lost my eternity. Now you're telling me two words. You're sorry? <laughs> you have to be clever. Don't let them fool you. In Hebrew, we have a say that it's a secular, secular uh, sentence. They made it up. What is it? Tzochek mi tzochek Very clever. I love this sentence. It's not from the Gemara. 
And it's not from Chazal, it's not from the Rambam, it's not from Shulchan Aruch, it's not in the Zohar. In case you wonder, what does it mean? Tzochek, mi shetzochek acharon. Who is going to be laughing? The one who laughs in the end, that's what counts. Sometimes in a boxing match, first, ring, first round, the, the, white, uh, the white pants uh, boxer is smiling. Why? He was doing better. Second round is still smiling. Fourth round, fifth round, only the white, the white pants is smiling. The other one is getting beaten up left and right. Then in the last ring, the other one out of nowhere gave him one, crushed his mouth, knocked him on the floor, he's half dead already. <laughs> Who smiles in the end? That's what counts. Who cares that ten rings, you were la laughing, enjoying, smiling to the camera. So in the end, that's what, that's what they say, and they're very smart when they say that. It doesn't matter who enjoy right now. It matters who is going to enjoy for eternity after the soul exit the body. So for 30, 40 years of stupidity here, there's a very heavy price to pay. Yeah, we have to realize. What I think that makes me enjoy now, when I see the bill, I'm going to be nuts. For that, I'm going to pay so much. For this stupid ride on Shabbat, or the way I got dressed, or this and all that. For that, this is the price? If I only knew. So yeah, we have also something. Not knowing the, the law does not dismiss you from the punishment and from your responsibility. You cannot come to the judge and say, Judge, I didn't know that in that highway there's a speed limit. That's, I'm very sorry. Next time, read the signs. Come and learn. You became a driver, no? You had to learn those things. It's not my problem. But I really didn't know I'm innocent. Check me in the lie detector. I prove to you. Doesn't matter. You didn't know it's your problem. Judaism is the only religion that to be an ignorant is a crime. No other religion holds you responsible for your stupidity. You can be a stupid Christian. You can be a stupid Muslim, you can be a stupid Hindu, Hindu but you cannot be a stupid Jew, because it's a crime to be stupid. <laughs> you say, well, what do you want? Hashem made me stupid, what do you want from me? Not only Hashem made me stupid, now, you, now you're telling me it's a crime? <laughs> no, stupidity, it's a combination of two things. You're born with that, it's true, but you also develop it with the years. You can get out of it. If a person puts his efforts into life, he gets out of his foolishness, and he becomes better and better. I know one guy in yeshiva for more than three years. Nobody wants to learn with him, the poor guy. Nobody wants to learn with him. Why nobody wants to learn with him? Yes, one chair here, one last one. Why nobody wants to learn with him? Because whenever you learn with him, he doesn't understand anything. He doesn't understand anything. So no, so every guy who comes to the yeshiva for one month, for one month, two months, three months, is already becoming better than him. And a poor guy, three years, is learning, and he doesn't understand anything. But one thing about this guy, he was always on time. If you have to start nine in the morning, one minute before nine, he's already sitting with the Gemara open. If it's three in the afternoon after lunch break, two or three minutes before, he's already sitting, and he's already ready for the shiur. You understand? So what's going on here? Since he did not give up, in one moment, everything opened up. One week, all of a sudden, everything that he heard for the last three years that he couldn't say anything, everything like an explosion, everything came out. All of a sudden, he became a teacher. <laughs> Just a week ago, nobody opened up. Because Hashem was testing him, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see, how long you gonna, you're going to invest in learning, how long, even though you, have, you don't see any fruits from your efforts, it comes in one shot. You should know that Torah, the learning of the Torah, it's against human logic, which means if you learn math five hours, you have amount of knowledge that you can gain in five hours. So that means if you learn ten hours, you have exactly double, right? Five hours of math plus five hours of math, it's ten hours of math and nothing more. Torah, you gain more by the hour. The first hour you get X amount, the second hour is a little bit more than that X amount. 
the third hour is a little bit more. And the fourth and the fifth and the millionth, the more you learn, it's like a snowball. Every round is much bigger than the one before. This is how it is, because it's all a gift. To know the wisdom of God, to begin with, is impossible. Since God is giving it to us as a gift, the gift giver decides how much he wants to give you. One dollar, or ten dollar, or a million dollar. Spiritually. So let's continue. So it says like this. Be careful from the honor of the rabbis, of the Chachamim. Why? Once a Jew reached a level of knowledge in a Torah, Hashem gives him a lot of respect to this person. A lot of respect. He saves from him a lot of embarrassment. A lot of agony and things that other ordinary people have every day, he gets saved from it. So because of you not respecting him, it's showing that you disrespect Hashem. What does it mean? If, if I respect my father, right, and you see that I love him and respect him, and if you, if you don't respect my father, you don't respect me. You understand? Because for me it's very important to respect him. So by not respecting him, you're actually not respecting me. By not respecting the Chachamim, the wise scholars, is showing that you don't care about what Hashem ordered us. So what's going to be the outcome? What's going to be the payment for that? Everything has a payment. Everything. It's not instant. Sometimes it can be seven years later. But it's written in your file. You cannot avoid it. What is it? She, be careful that you won't get burned. If you disrespect them, you may get burned. We, we're all talking spiritually here. She, neshichatam, neshichat shual. When they bite, it's like a bite of a fox. You don't want to feel when a, when a fox is biting. It's much worse than a dog. They look the same. Same mouth, same size, and even the teeth look similar. But you don't want the fox to bite you. If God forbid you have to be beaten by somebody, it's better be a dog, not a, not a fox. Ve'akitzatam akitzat akrav. When they sting you, it's not like a bee or anything like this. It's like a scorpion. Scorpion, a poisoned one, it's the worst thing. The Gemara say, three things come to a person in a big surprise. That whenever he's never ready for it. What is it? One is finding a lost object, like money on the street. You walk in the street, oh, a hundred dollar bill. How? Right away you jump on it. Before you even realize, you're all over it. Maybe somebody second jump on will grab it a second before you. So since it's like a big surprise, right away, change your status. You're walking quietly, you're falling asleep. So I, oh, all of a sudden you become a tiger. It's a big surprise. Then, Mashiach. The day that Mashiach comes, we're all going to be somewhere. One of us will walk on the street, one of us will be snoring, one of us will be eating lunch, one of us will be in the middle of a business meeting, one of us will be in the middle of a lecture, some of us will learn Torah, one person could be in the middle of the bathroom. Oh, oh, how, how would we know that Mashiach came? All of a sudden you hear a huge siren, something that never heard before. Huge siren, like a blowing shofar, but a billion times stronger. Everything will shake, the windows, the chandeliers, everything. It's going to be such a shofar, and everybody will realize. In Israel, 80 years ago, maybe 90 years ago, one rabbi was teaching his students near Tel Aviv, he was teaching them Gemara, and all of a sudden they heard a huge siren. Just when it started, the rabbi fainted. So the student picked him up, an old man. Rabbi, Rabbi, what happened? So he said, where is he? Where is he? He said, where is who? He said, the Mashiach. Where is he? Is he already? He said, no, Rabbi, what Mashiach? So what was this siren? The British put, for the first time in Israel, a train. Nowhere in, East, in Israel didn't have train. The British or the Turkish. A hundred years ago was the Turkish. They put the train. You know, you ever stood by a train when it makes the noise? Ooh, wow, well, it's such a loud siren. He never heard such a thing in his life. All of a sudden, he hears such noise right across the street. Right away, he fainted because he, he's expecting Mashiach every day, like a kosher Jew. Once he heard that, he fainted right away. So just imagine when it comes. So the Gemara says, so three things. Finding a lost object, 
משיח and a scorpion, a crab. You sit somewhere on a rock, in a field, all of a sudden you feel, it's like a needle. Top. Two or three minutes later, it's over. Why the Gemara use these three examples? You know, there's a lot of wisdom. They can give another thousand cases. That is big surprise, no? Big surprise. Many things can be a surprise. You know? So the Gemara, the secret here is, when, when Mashiach come, for some Jews it will be like finding a lost treasure, and for some Jews it's, it's going to be like a scorpion that comes to kill you. Why? Not every Jew will have the merit to stay when Mashiach come. We say every day in a prayer, apart from the prophet, what do we say? Ova letzion goel leshave pesha beyakov. The Savior comes to Zion, the nation of Israel. To who? What's the verse? To who? Leshave pesha beyakov. Translation to the Jews. Yaakov is the nation of Israel. To the Jews who re repent, repented already, before, not after. After it's too late already. You cannot accept converts and no more Baalei Tshuva. Once you hear the shofar, all the wicked Jews would run, Rabbi, Rabbi, open the window, let me jump. I'm sorry, there's a new boss in the world. Till now was the Rabbi of the, of the area. Now Hashem sent his messenger, it's over. No more Baalei Tshuva, no more converts, all the Arabs will scream, Yahud, open the door. Too late. Now they say, they do all kinds of things, they will regret it dearly. Christians, the most, one, one, one student asked Rabbi Abdon Yitzchak in one of the lectures, he said, Rabbi, so tell us, when Mashiach come, what's going to be? What's with all these churches, all these masks everywhere? Is Mashiach going to explode it to pieces, or what? So the Rabbi, Rabbi Abdon Yitzchak said, no, he won't touch it. So the guy asked, so what's good is Mashiach? I was still going to hear this every morning, <laughs> all this noise. <laughs> so the rabbi told him, no, you didn't get me right. The Mashiach won't have to bother with that. He said, why? What do you mean, rabbi? He said, they, the Arabs and the, and the Christians, they will blow up their mosque and, and, their, and their churches. As soon as they hear that Mashiach is here, they'll blow it up. So he said, why, rabbi? He said, from the embarrassment not to show any evidence of their stupidity, what they used to do for, for 3,000 years, for 2,000 years, whatever. They will, they will burn it right away. Why? To show the Messiah that we worship an idol, a dead body of somebody. It's going to be a big embarrassment for them, because they hope to stay also. You should know that righteous goyim also will remain. No discrimination. Righteous goyim will see Mashiach. Wicked Jews will not see Mashiach, I'll make it clear to you. Wicked Jews, we, Jews who do not keep Shabbat, Jews who do not live according to the law of purity with their spouse, Jews who send their kids to public school and they show them television to the kids, or they watch television themselves every day, and all the dirt on television, they are wicked. They are not following Hashem. So somebody like this has a very serious problem. Where is only Hashem knows to put on a scale the good that you do and the bad and to decide if you deserve to remain or not. We do not know. I definitely cannot give a person a mark and say he passed and he failed. No. Only Hashem knows. But I'm telling you what the Torah say. The Torah say a Jew that contaminates his eyes with dirty things is wicked. A Jew that doesn't keep the laws is wicked. A Jew that doesn't put fear in every day is wicked. What does it say? Karkafta de lo manichat filin. Nikra Poshea Israel Begufo. Translation, a scalp that does not have filin is a criminal of the nation of Israel. Criminal of the nation of Israel. That's what Hashem says about the Jew does not make sure to put one of the three covenants, filin. Shabbat, what Shabbat? Shin, Bet, Taf. Shin, Shabbat. Bet, Brit Mila. Taf, Tfilin. What's special about the three mitzvot? Shin. It's, this is the three mitzvot out of 613 that Hashem called the mitzvah Ot. What does it mean, Ot in Hebrew? A sign, a covenant. Ot i beni uvenechem. It's a sign between me and you that you are my children. Shabbat, what do we say? Shabbat, 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 Shabbat
the nation of Israel make the Sabbath an, an eternal covenant between me and the nation of Israel, Ot Ileolam, it's a sign for eternity that you are my children and we made an agreement. You do not keep it, you don't belong to me. Very simple. Second, Tfilin, Vayal Ot Aliyadecha, should be a sign on your hand every day. You don't have it, you have a problem, you don't have the second sign. And what's the third one? Circumcision. And the ladies, everything that their husband gets, they get as well. So if a woman gets married, if a husband is putting tefillin, it counts like she does. If he learns Torah, it counts like she does. If he keeps Shabbat with her together, it's very good for both of them. Uh, if she has boys and they circumcise them, it's their mitzvah as well. So the ladies participate with the men. Let's continue. Then... So the recommendation of the Mishnah, be very careful, do not, if you finally decided to mess around with someone and to disrespect someone, make sure it's not someone who knows a lot of Torah, because you're going to pay a million times worse. If you do something to an ordinary Jew, it's a sin. Hashem does not allow it. Hashem does not allow to embarrass a Jew. Hashem does not allow to disrespect people. But if it's a Talmud Chacham, it's much, much worse. What's the proof? If you insulted a Jew, you insulted a Jew, how many times you have to go to this Jew to ask him to forgive you? Up to how many times? Three times. Once, twice, three times. If he doesn't want, you don't have to go anymore. That's it. Hashem saw that you did everything you could. That's considered everything you could. But what happens if it's a person who learns Torah and he knows a lot of Torah? Even a thousand times, you still have to continue to go. You have to go. You went already 900 times. Every day you drive. It costs you 50 bucks to get him. With all the tolls and the gas, you're begging him, you're calling him, you're running, you're, ch you're chasing him, you come to shul, you go around, you go to his house. A thousand times almost. Not enough. You want to clear your record from all these bad things? Even a thousand times will not do it. Just so a clever person doesn't get into this trouble. Here, give, make him room, please. You know, we're going to need to ask Levy to buy the next house. <laughs> we have to He's break working this on wall. it. Huh? He's working on it. He's working on it, right? I heard a room here. We're going to have to break this wall. There's not, it's not enough room here, Baruch Hashem. It's a big living room. All right, so let's continue. Rabbi Yoshua says, pay attention good now. Ayn ara, evil eye. Yetzer ara, evil inclination. Vesinat abriot, being hated by the public. Motsiim et adam in haolam, destroying the life of a person. Ayn ara, why ayn ara, evil eye. Some people say, Rabbi, it's superstition, I don't believe in this. Ah, come on, what is it? When the 21st century you're talking to me about evil eye, I have news for you, my friend. It's in the Gemara. It's in the Zohar. It's in the written Torah. Bilan, the prophet of the Goim, Bilan, he wanted to put evil eye on the nation of Israel, and Hashem protected us, the Torah says. Bilan had one eye, so his eye was even worse than an, an ordinary person. And Hashem was protecting us from that, protected us. So that's one thing. The Gemara say 99% of the people die from Ayn Ara, 1% die in a natural death. 99% die from Ayn Ara, which means, which means, this is what it means. It means, of course, if a person deserves to die, he dies with or without Ayn Ara. But just to give you an idea that Hashem used that Ayn Ara as a cause for the death, even though with, with or without that a person one day has to leave this world, just to show you the effect of the Ainara. That's why they say if you have a business, make sure nobody sees all the time where you're storing your merchandise. Because the blessing is in a hidden rooms, in a storage that nobody sees. Make sure not to reveal to your friends and, and needless to say your enemies how much you have, how much money you made, how much you're going to make, what house you're going to buy. Never speak about it. If your wife is pregnant, the first three months, you're not allowed to say to anybody in the world, not even to your parents, that she's pregnant. Only after three months. 
Be careful, be very careful. It's a big risk. Something can go wrong. So there's many, many other examples. You can watch my lecture about Ayn Ara. I have about an hour and a half just about that in a website to explain to you how it works. So Ayn Ara is very risky. Yetzer Ara, the evil inclination, we already know. We see the results of what our Yetzer Ara does to us every day, no? We see how many sins we make. So you got to stay away from that. Sinat Abriot means if people hate you, your life becomes a nightmare, torture, everywhere you go. Stay away from him, don't do business with him, don't live next to him, don't let your children pay with them, they this, they that, they destroy you. You know, you cannot do anything. So that's, this, that's actually eliminating you from this world. You're here, but you're really not here. The 12th Mishnah of this Perek, Rabbi Yossi says, Make sure you love the money of your friends like you love your own money. What does it mean? Many of us, if we stay at home, we put the air condition on a certain degree. Let's say, I don't know, 72. Why we don't put it on 68? Because it costs a lot of money. If it's 68, the air condition will work around all Shabbat. It costs a lot of money. 72, as long as we don't sweat, we save some money. But if his friend gives him his house for Shabbat, we're going away, you want to use our house for Shabbat? Over there he puts it on 65. Why? It's my friend's money. Big sin from the Torah. Very big sin. Mamash almost like stealing. If he didn't have permission, it's a big problem. Also, give another example. Uh, when a person leaves his house, he makes sure all the lights are off. But if you stay by his friend downstairs in the basement, he goes shopping, he comes back, he leaves the lights on, or even the air conditioner, or the heat in the winter, why? When he comes back, he doesn't want to wait five minutes until it cools the room. So now, my friend is paying. You understand what we're talking here about? Let's say you have your, your, your car, you put the best gasoline. One time you borrow a car for two, three days from your friend, you put cheap gasoline. Ah, that makes damage to the car, he won't know anyway. That person like this is a crook. It's not a clean person. When you behave towards your friend's property like you behave towards your, the same way you behave to your own property, then you're a kosher person. If not, you gotta work on yourself. You have to realize it's a part of religion. I know many people that are very righteous when somebody else paid the mitzvah. With their money, they're very righteous. But their own money, uh, you know, same thing food, you do catering in your own home, you use it very carefully. Somebody else pay for it, yeah, la rabbi, no big deal, don't be stingy, throw it, so what? It's a little bit left. <laughs> in his arm, he leaks the jar from inside, he breaks it to pieces, not to miss one gram. But in somebody's house, oh, rabbi, what? throw it, it's a little bit left, what's the big deal? If you are also sloppy when it comes to your own property and you neglect things and you leave them on the street and people steal it and then you did the same thing with your friend it's still a big problem because you still have a problem between you and your friend but at least you have a claim to make <laughs> when you come to Hashem and say Hashem what, what, what did I do to him worse than I do to my own thing I have a bicycle I leave it every week they steal it like my son every time he had a bicycle a week later it's gone you know he goes to a place why didn't you tie it no, I just left it for an hour and it's gone. Beloni, it was there all day. No, uh, one go he saw it and he took it. You understand? Not him. Don't look at him. <laughs> he is good. He's careful with his stuff. Anyway, so now, make sure your schedule starts with planning your hours of learning Torah. Men and women. Women also have to learn Torah. Some Jewish women think that, ah, we don't have to learn Torah, Rabbi. The Rabbi will tell me what I need to do. Once in a while I have a question. Uh, so that's not how it works. A person must set up times every day to learn Torah before business. Before setting up his schedule in the office, how many customers is going to meet tomorrow. First, how do I start my day? What time I pray? How, how long I learn after? When I learn, my cell phone is off, nobody knows where I am. That's called Torah Words of Torah do not remain in the head of a person unless if he kills himself for it. 
What does it mean? Literally, you cannot kill yourself because you're dead. What does it mean? Killing yourself means that when you learn, nobody can disturb you. Emergency, not emergency, they don't even know who you are. You're not in the world. Where were you? We're looking all over. The storm is burning. I don't care. Until 12 o'clock, I'm dead. You want to bring me back from the grave? I'm not here. But if we would be able to reach you, you would tell us where the alarm is. We'll call the, the, the fire department. This, all your merchandise will get saved. Because you hid yourself to learn Torah. Look how much you lost. Beloni. That's a decree that I had in Rosh Hashanah to lose this money. It's not because I learned. I would lose it one way or the other. But the test is that Hashem supposedly showed me, you see, you learn Torah and your store went on fire. You get tzedakah in the morning in a shul to the rabbi, and a minute later they tow your car. That's a test. <laughs> Where is the test? You just get tzedakah and you came out and you saw somebody just gave you a million dollars. That's a test. The test is the timing. The punishment is because of sins that we did a while back. But Hashem waits. When do I give him the punishment? It's very critical. If I give it to him when he made another sin, it's no big deal. He knows he deserves it. There's no test. When will I give it to him? When he does something great. Let's see if he still trusts my Torah or not. When I promise that in the end I'm faithful to pay reward to all my lovers who keep my mitzvot. That's what I promised in my book. In reality, I just did a great mitzvah, I learned an hour to buy, I came out, the car is gone. That's a test. And if I say, ah, Baruch Hashem, Ishtabach Shemo, thank you, everything I accept with love, then the reward is a hundred times better. When a person blessed for the bad, like he blessed for the good, is a very, very high level. The, Gmar, the Mishnah in Masech and Brachot, the ninth chapter, Perek Aroe, it's about three Mishnayot speaking about the obligation to make a blessing to Hashem on the bad things that supposedly looks bad. Nothing is bad. On the bad things, like we do the same blessing for the good things. That shows that you have emunah, faith. Torah does not pass as inheritance. If your father is a millionaire, when he dies, you also supposedly become millionaire, because he take away everything he has, right? But if your father is a millionaire in Torah and mitzvot, he cannot inherit anything to you. If your father is the chief rabbi, and you're not going to sweat and learn, you're going to be a, a zero loser, nothing. You don't know anything. Just because your father knows a lot of Torah doesn't mean one day you can inherit from him all his knowledge. So therefore, it doesn't matter who your father is. Remember, Esav's father was Yitzchak. Yitzchak knew a lot. And Esav was a hunter in the field. Why? He didn't inherit the holiness from his father. So everybody has to put his own efforts and make sure everything you do, you aim. Where do you aim? Not for the reward. Not for honor. Not for compliments. For one thing only, for the sake of heaven. Why do you do it? Why you sweat so much? Why you kill yourself to do this mitzvah? Yeah, don't kill yourself. Don't be fanatic. Why? Because I know it's satisfied Hashem. Hashem is happy for me. I'm happy. It's hard. It's easy. It doesn't matter. First, why do I do it? Because Hashem wants me. Why do I forgive my friend? Because Hashem would like me to do. Why I'm not suing him? Because Hashem would want me to give up. Why don't I do this? This because Hashem wants. Make sure first you care about what He wants before what you want. Then for sure you will be righteous. The 13th Mishnah, Rabbi Shimon says, be very careful when you say Shema every day, morning and evening. Why? This is a mitzvah that you can never repeat. Once the time expires, it's gone. There's no way to get it back. Remember, it's very critical. A man is obligated to say Shema Three hours from the sunrise every morning. Today the sunrise was around 5.30 approximately. So three Jewish hours after, it makes it around 8.33 this morning. So if a person woke up in the morning a little late, make sure the first thing you do, you wash your hands and say right away, Shema, don't waste another minute. Why? Once 8.33 pass, you can say a million times after, you lost the mitzvah. What about women? Women, are not, she's not obligated, because every mitzvah that has a timing, women are not obligated. Why? They have other obligations. 
So since it comes in a certain period of time, morning, only evening, or once a month, or things like this, women are not obligated. You have to say Shabbat, technically women were, would, would have to be dismissed, because it's a peri periodic mitzvah. But the Torah says specially that even though it's a mitzvah that comes periodically every week, women are obligated to keep Shabbat because it's a covenant. But otherwise, if the Torah wouldn't say clearly, women didn't have to keep Shabbat. Why? Every mitzvah that is subject to a certain time, women are dismissed. So since it's mitzvah in the morning, but remember, a woman, every woman can keep the mitzvot of the man even if she's not obligated and she still get a reward. She get a reward. Even a goy that does some of the mitzvot that is not obligated will get a reward for it, even though it's not obligated. But some mitzvot the goy is not allowed to do. Some mitzvot, like for instance to keep Shabbat. What else? To learn Torah that is specifically for Jews, like the laws of Shabbat, the laws of tefillin, the laws of circumcision. This is only for Jews, it's not allowed to touch. General Torah about the creation of the world, about faith and God and things like this, about prayers is allowed. It's no problem, it's a human being. Things that are specific for Jews is not allowed. For instance, if a guy wants to put tefillin, is it allowed or not? Why is it not allowed? Because he doesn't know how to respect that feeling enough. He sees it. He doesn't understand what does it mean, Shema Yisrael. He doesn't understand. But if he's in the process of converting, after a few months that he goes to, to learn by a rabbi every day, at one point the rabbi can allow him to put feeling, to prepare him from the day after he dips in the mikveh and he becomes a Jew. So everything we have to do, we have to do for the sake of heaven. Time is running out, we have five more minutes. Let's try to finish this perek. Hopefully we'll be able to do it. Rabbi Shimon says, be, 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 be very careful with Shema and in prayers. When you pray, pray on time. Don't pass the time. If it's sunset, after that it's already night time. Make sure you pray Mincha before. And when you pray, don't pray like a robot. You're not a tape recorder. Try to think about what you say. Try to shake yourself before and concentrate. I'm about to pray five minutes in front of Hashem to pray of Shmon Eisre. Even though I say it thousands of times, I have to think about what I say and understand the words. Those of you, which you, all of you are Americans, most Americans do not understand Hebrew. The old Hebrew. They maybe understand Hebrew if they live in Israel, but if they went to Yeshiva, then they understand. But those who did not go to Yeshiva, having, and one day they become religious, they don't understand the Hebrew, so at least the Hebrew of the prayers of every day, they have to do everything they can to learn. They write in their own language, in Russian, in English, in any language, above the Hebrew words, the translation of every word. So when he says, Baruch Ata Hashem, he has to understand what he says. When he says, Chonenu, Anenu, Shmat Filatenu, all these words that we say for a million times, it's a shame to die one day and Hashem show you all your prayers and you do not understand one thing. You should know that if a person does not understand what he says, it's better off to pray in a foreign language than in Hebrew. Why? The idea of the prayer is to shake the heart, to shake your soul, to wake you up, to inspire you. If you don't understand what you read, it's like me reading Chinese. What do I understand? I know roughly what it's supposed to be, but it doesn't wake me up. So if a person still do not know Hebrew, it's better he prays in English, at least it makes him close to Hashem. He knows what he's asking for. He knows what not to do. If he prays, he just read the words. But the idea is to learn the, at least the most important parts of the prayers, which means Shema Yisrael, Tfilat Shemona Yisrael, this is the most important parts. The Birkot HaShachar in the morning, the morning blessing, to understand what you say. Then, when you pray, you have to have a broken heart, full of mercy. You, you beg Hashem for mercy, like, you, like a person who begs for his life in court, and about to give you the electric chair. You saw how they beg for their life. Please, judge, I'm begging you. I have children, I have wife. That's how a person has to be every time you pray. Not like a robot, like he called his eyes. Ta -ta 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 -ta. That's it. He doesn't even remember where he is. You understand? Then. Today when people pray, they have to say an extra bracha. What is it before they start? Filata derech. 
the prayers of those who goes on the way. Why? As soon as they start, Hashem Sfatai Tiftach, Ufiya Giti Latecha, they in Japan. <laughs> oh, I was there in Japan, there was a good show, jewelry show. Oh, but tomorrow I'm in Vegas, there's a big show. All of a sudden he wakes up, where am I? How did I get to Tel Aviv? He doesn't remember where he is, he gets confused. Where was I? I'm here, I'm here. Why? He doesn't pay attention. Then, you have to remember that the Torah says, Ki el chanun verachum. Hashem is merciful, is able to forgive, he has a lot of patience before he punish, he's full of kindness, and is capable of forgiving even the most horrible sins. One last thing in this Mishnah, a person has to remember, don't hold yourself wicked. Even though, if we be honest, we're not so righteous. Let's be honest. But giving yourself a mark of a wicked person will not make you better in your Avodat Hashem, in you following Hashem. No, why? You have to remember one thing. If a person rates himself too low, he will give up. He will give up. If you rate himself too high, he will not do anything according to the halacha. Why? I'm already a tzaddik. A person has to look at himself 50-50. 50% good, 50% bad. The Rambam writes, a person has to always evaluate himself 50-50 on a scale. And the next mitzvah is going to do will determine if the scale will go to the positive side or to the negative side. If he made a scene, that scene made the scale go to the negative side and the whole world goes to the negative side. Because the Jew affecting the whole world. If he did a mitzvah, he went to the positive side and the whole world went to a positive side. If a person thinks that way, he will feel the responsibility. When you fly a plane, you are very nervous. Not only for your life, for 500 people with you. So you are more careful. If you fly by yourself, if you're a pilot that flies an empty plane, you're not as careful than when you have 500 people in your back. It's, that's the way it is. Same thing the, the commanders in the army, they'll tell you. If it was only me, I don't care. But when it's me and my soldiers, I have more responsibility. How will I knock on their mother's door tomorrow to tell her that my soldier died in the middle of operation? Just from that thought, I'm putting all my efforts. When I was in South Carolina, I met an Israeli warrior, one of the best that we had, very big operation overseas in very special operations. We became friendly. He's in the top unit in the whole army. The biggest fighters. Like you see in all these Hollywood movies, over there it's all baloney. It's computer effects. <laughs> this guy, bullet here, bullet here, bullet there, operation here, in this country, in that country. A real big shot. Baruch Hashem Baal Tshuva today. As in the end, Enod Milvado. Only it's me and Hashem, and everything else is nonsense. So, Rabbi Eliezer said, Torah, put all your efforts in Torah. And learn, while you're learning Torah, also what to answer the Apikors. What Apikors? Apikors we call today an atheist. What's an atheist? Deny the Torah, Hashem, eh, oral Torah, Shulchan Aruch, the Rabbis, I don't believe, prove to me. You have to know how to answer them. It's not enough to know only Gemara and Halacha. You have to know how to argue with the seculars, to show them that they're wrong. Not to let them feel we have the truth and they are dreaming. No. Make sure they always understand they live in a lie. What's this word Apikos? There was one Greek guy that his name, his name was Apikos. In Greek, philosopher Apikor. He lived 400 years before the destruction of the Second Temple, when the Greek Empire were in control. Since he was speaking against God constantly and against the philosophy of the Jews, they made this, this made this an expression. Apikos means someone who denies the validity of the Torah. Don't be afraid to work very hard and sweat. You're only earning. You should not complain. To sweat and get a result 
is not painful. It's only painful when you sweat for nothing. They put you in jail and you serve some kind of uh, low life. That's a horrible feeling. I'm working, they're killing me, and I don't even get a dollar for it. Look what they're doing to me. But us, we are free. Why? We do it for Hashem. We do it for because Hashem told us to do. Hashem doesn't need it from us. It's for our own benefit. But well, one thing for sure, Hashem is not a member in the Israeli Knesset. That they promise a lot before the election, and a day after they don't even remember what they said. What did I say? I don't, really, I don't recall promising it. With Hashem, there's a promise, it's going to go through. And you should know that Hashem is faithful to keep every promise that He made in the Torah. Soon or later, you're going to cash on it. Rabbi Tarfon say the day is short. He's talking about our life, it's an analogy. The day is short, and the work is too much, a lot. And the workers are very lazy. And the income is great. And the boss lost his patience. What is this? The, war, the day is short, which means life is short. Before you realize you died. Blink of the eye, that's life. Finish. There's so much to do. 613 mitzvot, Torah, Gemara, Mishnah, Halakha, Chumash, Zohar, Kabbalah. So much to learn. You need hundreds of years to finish the Torah. The workers, which is us, are snoring. Football, baseball, Chinese. <laughs> Rabbi, what sushi you bringing tomorrow to the lecture? <laughs> Everybody's dreaming. Which car will buy next year? Can we afford that car? No, maybe we'll buy this. <laughs> One guy came to Rav Steinman with his wife. So they're arguing if to buy a fancy car or not. So one wants a fancy car, and the guy doesn't want, he's afraid of Ainara. So the wife says, I want a nice fancy car, I'm tired of this car, no air condition, no, no leather seats, no sunroof, even a stereo is not working well. I want a nice car like my sister has, what's the problem, Rabbi? So the guy says, Rabbi, if I'm going to buy this fancy car, tomorrow the IRS will ask me questions. Plus everybody with their eyes, I'm afraid, it's too dangerous, let's live modest. So the rabbi asked him, did you finish already the whole shas, the whole gemara? He asked him. So he said, no. He said, did you finish one chapter in the whole gemara, one chapter? He said, no rabbi. Did you finish one page? Can I test you on one page? Rashi, Tosfot, what's the kushiyah, the roots, what's the subject? What's the secret? Where does it come from in the Torah? Can you put one little page together? I said, Rabbi, no, not yet. He said, you can buy any car you want, don't worry. Nobody will ever be jealous with you. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to be jealous. Go buy any car you want. At least enjoy this life. Since you don't have another life, you might as well enjoy now. You understand? We laugh, but we are worse than this guy. Anybody here can raise his hand and say, I can be tested on one page in the Gemara? Come on, I'll open the Gemara. Huh? You ask him, what kind of gold is that? Rabbi, this is 24, real one. What's this? 18 karat. What's this car? This car is this. You can buy it from here. You can do it here. You press this button, it's coming out. The new Ferrari came out. The size of the engine changed. They move it to the back. He knows everything. <laughs> what tire? What company makes the tire? What defect they had five years ago? Everything he knows. Who is the prime minister? Who got fired today? He reads the news 1,500 times a day. 10, 10 news, every 10 minutes the same news. He knows it by heart. Ask him, what was the news a week ago? <laughs> Torah, zero. You understand how the evil inclination is fooling us? So, the Balabayit, the owner is losing his patience. The Dochek, pushing you. Wake up, guys. Kadima, nothing is getting done. Wake up, wake up. How does Hashem waking us? Up, getting fired. Problems. This, that. They put you in a wedding in a bad place. You couldn't see the band, the Bukharian band playing all night. <laughs> what? So now you owe a thousand dollars, you erase a zero from the check, you erase it. <laughs> you came with a thousand. Once they put you in a bad angle, you said to your wife, no, no, no. Give me, you have another check? No, I only bought one. I don't care, I'm erasing one. <laughs> right. Where do they put me here? 
לא עליך המלאכה לגמור. Even though we have to put all our hearts in the truth and learn as much as we can, if we didn't finish the whole Torah, we shouldn't be upset. If we didn't finish one chapter all our life, we shouldn't be upset. We should be upset if we waste the time. But if we learn seriously, even one chapter all our life, has hundreds of things to learn. I only learned one. לא עליך המלאכה לגמור. You do not judge by quantity. You judge by quality and how many hours you put into learning. How much you achieve, not always it's in your hand. Some of us born with a sharp brain, some of us born with a black brain. You can learn a hundred times, you still don't understand. But since you have an effort, even you fall asleep in the middle of the lecture, but you come after a hard day at work, let's consider effort. You are not free to decide not to learn Torah like you may think. And if you learn a lot of Torah, you are earning a huge reward. And Hashem is faithful. And you should know that the reward is not here. It's waiting for you for life of eternity. We finished chapter 2, Baruch Hashem, today. So now we have four more chapters. So, Bezrat Hashem, next Monday also, try to be a little bit earlier, but we can start 8.45. Thank you for Levi that every Monday is hosting us.